So, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um, we wanted to kind of stop the music and be intentional and reflective about Israel at a particularly fraught moment. Because uh, pretty much every week we can count on headlines that are going to be presenting us with challenging stories. When I was in Israel, for example, Itamar ben Gavir, against the wishes of Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, decided to make a visit to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Prime Minister said, not a wise idea. Uh, why do this? Um, it, Itamar ben Gavir went anyway. He went earlier in the morning. Um, and of course, just controversy for its own sake. Uh, uh, of course he should do it, of course he should do it. We have a right to not have our land affected by Hamas, and we're going to just show them, and it's a show of strength, versus, oh my God, why invite yet another war? Just so unwise, and so provocative, and just like controversy. I am using a mic. I am, I, if you're not, can you not hear me? I'll take, can you not hear? Uh, no one's ever said that before. Uh, <laughs> But can I take Dan's mic if you have it? Yeah, let me just get me get Dan's mic. By the way, yesterday was since we we cut a little bit. We had taste of Shabbat Alive yesterday, and we do like a little Shabbat Alive for the little kids. And Rabbi West was doing the story. Your your ship impersonation require vocal skills. Oh, thank you. Can you do one? Uh, I'll do Call that Me was, Great That was impressive. Uh, so uh, impressive. Uh, anyway, um, is that better? Okay. So what I was to say is that there's just like a lot of controversy for its own sake. And you'll remember, it feels now like 100 years ago, but Wellesley. Remember in September when the Wellesley Daily News goes off on Israel and goes on and the mapping project and all this stuff. And all of those, and the issues of campus anti-Semitism, and the issues of our children and grandchildren being in a very distant place, all of that did not get made any better by the election results. Um, and if you've read the stories, there's just a lot of things that are happening with this new government that are concerning moves to weaken the judiciary, moves to weaken the Supreme Court, uh, moves to increase the power of the prime minister and his counselors over the appointment of judges, all of which would reduce checks and balances. There's moves to weaken the rights of Arab Israelis. There's moves to strengthen settlers. There's moves to demean our Judaism, diaspora Judaism. There's, there's voices about taking back the Robinson's Arch, where I was at a bar mitzvah for my nephew. Uh, right, take back, right. So there's a lot of stuff that is very in your face and very offensive and very problematic, and so what I wanted to do, all of which is challenging for ourselves, let alone Wellesley, let alone our kids and grandkids. So what I wanted to do is to step back and, and think about five different options about what might our posture t towards Israel be in this fraught season. So the first one, and, and this was an article that was, you know, we all read years ago, um, and it was, it's been in the case for, for a long time, which is there are rabbis and there are synagogues who simply do not talk about Israel. They say talking about Israel is too divisive. Uh, talking about Israel just ticks people off. Talking about Israel just pits people against one another. The whole idea of a religious community is to bring people together. Israel's the opposite of that. We're not talking about Israel. Um, so colleagues, what do you think about that posture? And can you even make 
a case for that posture? Is that case, is, is that posture, we're not going to talk about Israel because it's too upsetting and too divisive. Is that a plausible posture or do you think that's an abdication? Can I just sing? Yeah. I'm Can sorry? Can I just sing? <laughs> Can I just sing? <laughs> yeah. He just wants to sing. Um, well, I just want to be. I just want to be clear that when yeah. when you said take back Robinson's arch, it was just the Robinson piece. I actually one of the most heartbreaking moments that we had, and Ben, you were there with me in that moment, was to go to the Robinson's arch area in Israel, which at one point in time had this beautiful walkway that you could go and actually touch the wall, and there were notes that were in those ancient stones that had been set up in the egalitarian section that um, years ago now fell into disrepair. They had some sort of a, an issue there and they closed them off and you now cannot get there. And the egalitarian piece of the wall, which had been a very hard one and very challenging negotiation to work through, is is no you know it's rickety and crickety and and there's no one there and there's a guard watching you all the time and of course we can still make joy and beauty and blessing there but um, but it is very challenged by the current political landscape and um, and so here's your question is should we talk about that should we come home and should we you know should we talk about that should we talk about Israel in general. Um, should we talk about the wonderful things about Israel? And I think you know my answer because I did talk about Israel <laughs> just this past Shabbos. I think it's more important than ever to speak about Israel, to remain engaged in Israel, to go to Israel, to s learn and speak Hebrew, to be engaged and connected to our land and our people and part of the conversation that they're having, even when it's hard, even when it's about things like my values are not represented in the way I'd like them to be there at this moment, but to highlight that there are people who are living in Israel who actually agree with me and who are working on those same issues and, and those same okay. challenges, and it's a vibrant and alive homeland of the Jewish people. Okay, well, thank All you right. for that. Uh, um, can I go next? Yeah, sure. Usually cantors give shorter answers than okay. rabbis, so, you know. Um, you are a family of four, and you have a child living abroad. And that child is struggling, all right? You are not going to talk at home about that child? That's how I feel about Israel. You love that child. It's our child, or our father, whatever you want to call it. Completely wrong not to talk about it. Okay. So it feels like the energy here, anyway, is against this notion of not talking about it. Um, is there anyone, Dan or Elisa, anyone want to make a case that that is... Um, that there's actually a reason uh, that's plausible. Maybe it's not what we do, but it, there's a case for it. There's a plausible case for it. Anyone? So the only possible environment in which I could see a plausible case is if you do not have the skills to create an environment for a productive conversation. Mm. And that's, I really think, a, an important caveat. I don't think it's effective. You know, it's like little kids who grow up in a home where there's a secret. Um, oftentimes... You'll, the kids will know that secret. Um, and it, it happens, you know, I often see it at the end of life where someone passes away and there's a child that grew up in the family and this is now, you know, 60, 70 years back. But they always had this inkling that there was something that nobody was talking about. And after the death, it comes to light and they're like, I knew it my whole life. I knew there was something, right? So not talking about it, I don't think... It, we're, we're not like those uh, animals that can put their heads in the sand and just not Ostrich. see. Thank you. I was <laughs> like, word's gone. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, but I think if you don't have the skills to be able to foster a good community conversation, that might be your best strategy because it's true that talking about it, I don't think that's the right answer, but in a case where you can't create a supportive environment and where people are going to be bullying each other, that may be your best option. I don't think that's our best option, but... Right. Okay, so th that sounds like we're good, we're not gonna do that, we're gonna continue to talk about Israel. Okay, now, now, okay, good. Now. How about yes. now? Okay, now. So now comes, uh, you. I didn't happen to get presented this letter, but the second option was that, uh, you know, 330 American rabbis um, wrote, signed this letter, saying basically we're gonna boycott, uh, not Israel, but we're gonna boycott Israeli leaders whose words and whose rhetoric and whose policies are antithetical to our values, right? Smotrich, 
who says that you know seeing gay people means like you're driving through a red light. We don't want Smotrich to speak on the pulpit at Temple Emanuel, and so they. So they, um, they wrote a letter to that effect, okay? And my question is, would you uh, sign, or Ben Gavir, like provoke, possibly provoking another war? This is serious business. I mean, the last war was provoked. We've had several, you know, Ariel Sh back in the days of Ariel Sharon, you know, Israeli officials making a publicly bravado display of going to the Al-Aqsa Mosque tends to end up in war. It tends to end up in dead people and real challenges on both sides. Um, and so maybe we send a letter saying this is just not okay. Uh, what do you think, would you sign that letter, why so, or why not? So you took it to a really serious place, so I, I hesitate to say this, but I, I did have the reaction when you said this of how many reform, conservative, and reconstructionist congregations were going to be inviting Smotrich or Ben Gvir. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I don't know about, I mean, this statement feels like a, a big statement about something that, you know, lo kayam, like it, it wouldn't happen. They wouldn't right. have done it anyway. So, uh, so I'm really curious about what motivates that kind of a statement right. when it was completely unnecessary. Well, I was just going to say, added to that, it's not just that they wouldn't have invited them, but none of those Israelis would want to go there. Like, right. they would like, so, they would have been like, that's hysterical right. that you want me to come. I don't so, think you're Jewish. Okay, like, so let me, let me, it's a fair point on both ends, that is to say, the synagogues would never have them, they would never come, right? Um, so what's the case for it? And I just want to, I want to commend everyone, um, a great podcast uh, from the Shalom Hartman Institute of January 5th with Daniel Hartman and Yossi Klein Halevi and Alana Steinhain. And here's, and, and Daniel, who doesn't like, in general, alarmist rhetoric, right? He speaks in praise of this. And he speaks specifically, he says, the gold standard should not be, is it effective? Is it going to actually shape Israeli policy? Because this would be manifestly not effective. Obviously, no, Smotrich isn't going to read this and say, oh, wait a minute, I've rethought, <laughs> right? Right, no, but why is it? And, and here I think it is actually, I think it's worth taking seriously and not laughing at, which is that... What's the alternative to expressing your voice of displeasure? It's to being disgusted. And to saying, here's, here's why this letter is morally serious. It's better than the alternative, which is I'm done with Israel. To hell with Israel. I'm, I've had it up to here with Israel. I'm over Israel. If Israel can't see gay people, I'm done with Israel. If Israel wants to provoke another war, I'm done with Israel. I'm just so over Israel, I'm gonna disconnect. And Daniel, in this podcast on January 5th, says what's good about this is not that it's going to actually affect policy, but by giving voice, that anger means you're still in relationship. It's like people, I, we always love when people are angry at God. Love when people are angry at God. Because if you're angry at God, you're in relationship with God. A much more pernicious thing is people who are just over God. They are indifferent to God. God is not real to them. So I'll always take anger over indifference or over irrelevance. And this is anger, which means that there's a beating pulse to the relationship, which is better than indifference, Mr. Nesson. Yeah, um, I, well, it's loud. Um, I think that uh, I think that the invite should be it should it should happen, and the reason for that is I think that we that even though uh, we will most of us would probably disagree vehemently with the the politics, I think that um, that people being heard. And also having an opportunity to explain where they're coming from, and other people having an opportunity to uh, to uh, to push back on that, I think is appropriate. Now, what little Lisa said earlier, as long as it's a conversation that's not going to um, degenerate into a shouting match, and as long as, as long as it's a conversation, and as long, as long as it's a conversation between people who have uh, who who understand the complexities of the issues, I think mm. that that uh, that really should happen. So, yeah, you know, I mean, they may not come, they may not be invited, but I think that. Um, that uh, the opportunity should be extended, and uh, uh, but I also your point that Danielle Hartman made about about um, about relationship, I think, is really very important as, as well. So it's a little it's double edged sword, but uh, sorry, but I, I think that really, I, th I think that leaving people out, pushing people out, uh, no matter the complexity of their politics, I think is not uh, is not always uh, is, is not really the best way to go. Dan, can I just double click here? Sure. You're saying so. Let's say Smotrich and Ben Gavir think that we're not Jews and even they want to amend the law of return so the people that we convert don't come in, et cetera. Mm -hmm. 
let alone our marriages for a long time, have not been recognized. Mm -hmm. um, they want to take away Robinson's Arch. You think you would still want to extend them an invitation to speak on Israel Action Shabbat from the pulpit? <laughs> no, I'm, asking, okay, I'm okay. taking you seriously. No, 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 I understand because, that. Because, in other words, yes, because yeah. we, we want to... And what you're saying is, is radical and maybe even radically helpful, which is instead of shutting down, let's be radically open and say, Mr. Smotrich, Mr. ben -Gavir, we're all part of the Am Yisrael. Let's be in dialogue. Is that is let's, that? Let's the, be in dialogue and, yeah. ex and explain yourself. What? Why take away? Why not? You know? Why not accept my daughter as a Jew? You right. know, uh, for example, right? Yeah, I I want to pick up on uh, what Dan has said, only in to say that I think, with all respect to Danielle, this is one <clears throat> of the least helpful aspects of liberal societies right now, which is, we disagree with you, we're gonna boycott you. And on that level, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not sure that it's realistic that we would have the, the conversation, but I think the idea that we are closed to conversations is the least helpful instinct. That said, um, it, I have a problem with the strategy here, because the strategy is here is I'm gonna tell everybody I'm boycotting you. And I believe really strongly that one of the things we're called upon as Jews is to talk to, not about. And so it feels to me like a much more helpful liberal Jewish move would be for us to be writing letters to the government of Israel, to, their, to Smutrich's office, to Ben Gvir's office, to speaking to them about their policies, to supporting organizations in Israel that where Israelis are trying to speak to and make changes within mm. their governmental organization, not proclaiming loudly, and as I said, what I think mm. is the worst instinct of liberal societies, you are you know, to us. You know, right. we're, we're not going to, we're gonna boycott you and we're not gonna engage. Right, Aliza uh, Elias, anything to add? I would just say, I, I think this also reminds me of C-SPAN in our country and the way that when, our governing bodies became uh, a TV material. The way that they governed really shifted, and it feels like this is very, very much seeking attention rather than seeking to work on the solution, mm. and for that reason, I, I, I don't love it. And also, it, it just, if you know anything about Israel, it's preposterous. Like so, it's like I can't take it seriously on the on the merits of what they're writing. There's no universe in which that's a that's a serious claim, and it feels like it's more about graining these rabbis who've signed it attention than it is about actually working on the solution. Right. And it gives credence to those who right. use BDS right. against Israel in general, because when rabbis go ahead and use boycott. The, the mechanism of BDS to boycott Israel, right. then you are actually affirming uh, BDS. A couple of things right. I want to say. The first one is that, I'm not joking about this, but we are all trying to you know, defend our right to be included in Israel. And um, among these people who signed the letters, there are 40 cantors. So we shouldn't say that rabbi signed this letter. We should say clergy signed this letter. Okay. And I'm not joking about this. Okay. Uh, the second is that I would have never signed that letter. All right. I love Denny Gordy's piece about if you don't know Hebrew well enough, yeah, you really cannot understand what is the real cultural and yeah. complexity of Israel. Sometimes I feel. I've been in this country for 22 years. Sometimes I, ha I feel I'm in no place to criticize America for its politics. Even less, I would criticize Israel, a country that I've never lived in. Yeah, let's talk about Danny's piece for a second. Because I, let me just ask, uh, step back. You've shared your reaction. Aliza, what was your reaction to Danny's piece? And what, what did you think his core messages were? And did you like it? I love Danny. Um, <laughs> I just, I really love him. He, I, I love the way he writes. I love the way he invites you to see possibility where you might otherwise close doors. I love the way he uses imagery. Um, just that the image of the tombstone feels like mm. such a truth that, that there's an eternal reality that we, we cannot grasp. And, and if you give up on, if you give up, if you say there's no way this government's going to ruin everything, then you're giving up on the eternal reality of our homeland and that's an impossibility. I just, I find him to be brilliant, really compelling and really important. Wow. And Michelle, I know he was your Masada Kedushin. What was your, <laughs> what was your take on the Danny piece? So um, I also love Danny, we're <laughs> pro <t> <laughs> professing. Um, I, I 
I, and I and I agree with Eliza wholeheartedly that the image of the tombstones is so evocative and so just personally moving, um, deeply moving, as we think about all the places. I mean, for those of you in this room, to think about the places where your parents and grandparents are buried, and you know what the permanence of that is. Is your family still going back there? Our great grandparents? Do we even know? Are some of our great grandparents buried in places that we no longer can go to? And so that image is just so real for the Jewish people. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree with him, um, having just experienced this, being in Israel, and when you're in Israel and you're walking there and you're talking to Israelis and you're connecting with people and programs who are making changes there, you have such a deeper, richer sense of what that culture is. So he's 100% right. We need to learn to read, to engage, to connect, to, to hear their news sources. And, you know, I, I don't love the, the tone that is sort of a little bit um, chiding of American Jews in general. Right. Um, it, it feels to me like a, an invitation to learn and engage is, is a little more helpful than don't talk to me if you don't know how to read Hebrew. But he's um, American born. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, he well, is. Uh, Dan, what was, what was your take on it? So, um, the first, my first read was, yes, it sounds great. And then I thought about it and said, well, I, I don't agree. And I don't agree because I think, like, for instance, can we make any kind of rational decisions about how we feel about uh, the war in Ukraine? Uh, we don't read Ukrainian. We don't read Russian. We don't know, you know, we don't know the, the nuances of those languages. Mm. And yet we're all able to understand the, the complexities of the politics. So I, I think I, that I disagree with you. Oh, I that's don't think fine. we you're, can you're, understand. You're I don't to. think we can understand the, the complexity of the politics. Okay, um, I say I, I believe that we can, and I believe that um, that we can understand we can understand world, world politics um, through people that that have a broader, a deeper understanding of it that, mm. that present the information. When you read, you can read all kinds of you know good news on on the internet. You can read all kinds of good news on uh, in uh, in the in newspapers. So you can get that information without necessarily really without necessarily uh, reading the language. Yeah. So I'm not sure that I agree a hundred. Not that I uh, disagree. I think it's important for us to really understand and really speak, you know, really read Hebrew more deeply. But right. on the other hand, I don't think that, that that should be a call to say, gee, you can't, you're not allowed to make any kind of real uh, decisions. You're not allowed to have any real impact, real deep understanding, unless you actually read the language. So I, I really disagree with that. Huh, interesting. Well, I will just say, um, first of all, I, I love the piece. And I really took it to heart because... I don't read Hebrew fluently enough to read uh, the newspapers. And in his piece, he, he brings you pieces from Israeli uh, newspapers about change within Israel, ferment within Israel, evolution within Israel from the Israeli right. You know, he brings pieces of an Israeli Haredi right of center Orthodox rabbi saying, uh, the campaign is over, you gotta govern, and you gotta govern responsibly and stop with all the anti-Arab animus. And you don't have, ac and he talks about the uh, different protests that are welling up in spaces that are classically right of center spaces, where right of center people, Israelis, are protesting. And without being able to, and that's not reported in the New York Times, and that's not reported in the Washington Post, and it's not reported on CNN, but it is reported in Haaretz, and it is reported in Ma'arif, and without... Hebrew, you don't have access to it. I don't have that Hebrew. That made me really realize that I, and this, so it was a call for humility, and it was a call for more education. And I, you know, it's, it's a nice theoretical question, which is, if you were running a rabbinical school, if you were the dean of a rabbinical school, or a cantorial school, would you require a Hebrew Converse, you know, being able to read Hebrew literacy so that you could actually read Haaretz, read Ma'ariv, um, as a prerequisite, because you know I certainly was ordained without that, um, and I just thought it was a super thoughtful piece. Right, but I mean that was the goal, at least. I mean we spent a year in Israel; all of our classes were in Hebrew. That the right. goal of the rabbinical program, at least that I attended, was to make sure that we were conversant not only with Hebrew but actually with Israeli life, and that we were able to engage and right. access on that on that level. Can you read Ma'ariv fluently? 
I well, I'm 23 years rusty on right. my <laughs> right. on my Hebrew, but I will say there's a um, you know Haaretz comes in English too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so. but I, I I love the tone of humility, um, and I appreciated I mean, when he was chiding and castigating. He was chiding and castigating me, and I accepted it. I, I thought that what he said was right, actually, it's and I think I need to change my game. I actually think he brings up another really Please. important point that's part of the landscape, which is the idea that all of us as Americans really understand very deeply and viscerally, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, is that none of us, uh, or very few of us, said, you know, the political landscape has changed mm. in America, and therefore that's it, I'm done right. with America, right? right. And, and I think it's really important that we bring that piece of, of yeah. the lens yeah. back to our understanding of Israel in much the same way that American politics change, you know, yeah. cyclically, um, and all politics throughout the world in any country, so too in, in Israel. And that does not mean that all of those places where, you know, a few months ago you had great hope. I mean, hear Micha Goodman speaking about the government that was the most recent government before right. this in Israel and all the ways that he had hope. It doesn't, like, they haven't disappeared. They're just right. not in power right now. Yeah. I want to just double click on that because that's going to pivot us to, uh, to Yassi Klan Halevi. And I think that's what pivots us to this uh, a personal. That what he's saying about Israel applies to us and our spouse, applies to us and our kids, applies to us and any relationship that we have. He says, and as for that, I sadly cannot support the Jewish state anymore. Here's my other question. Uh, when you were distraught about what was happening in the, to the United States, why didn't I hear you say, I can't support America anymore? Why in one case did you decide to get to work, to get politically engaged, to organize, to fight back, while in the other you chose to wash your hands of a country because of a coalition government that didn't even exist yet? What does it say about your worldview and the country that you did decide to wash your hands of is the only country on the planet whose express purpose is saving the Jewish people? Here's what I took away from that, which is, which is that a coven to be in a covenantal relationship, like let's start, start with a marriage. Right? The ultimate covenantal relationship is a marriage. And what do you do when your marriage hits a rough patch? Most marriages, if you're married 40, 50, 60 years, it's pretty uh, inevitable that any marriage is going to hit a rough patch. And what do you do when your covenantal marriage hits a rough patch? Do you cut and run? Do you say, sadly, I can't support you know, my marriage. Well, no, of course, Judaism permits divorce, and of course, there are times where the right response and the healthy response is divorce. That is, of course, the case. But that's certainly not your first resort. That's your last resort. Your first resort is how do we repair? How do we redeem? How do we restore? How do we make it better? Right? And the notion that, um, you know, and if our relationship with Israel is covenantal, then the same logic applies let's make it better. And that I think is really important because. At the base of that marriage analysis is the vision of your partner as a partner, as a beloved, as someone to whom you, you have dedicated yourself, who you love. And um, the, the example that I, I often think about in American politics is that, um, and I, I'm, I'm going to talk politics, American politics here, I'm warning, um, but that when Obama was elected, there was this, on the left, this sense of like, our person is here and he's going to save us. And there was, um, on the left, very little willingness to enter into any criticism. And Obama actually deported more people than any president before him. And in, in some cases, really horrible deportations that shouldn't have happened. And there was total silence. And then when Trump was elected, the liberals who were totally silent while Obama was president, who were okay with his policies vis-a-vis -vis immigration, suddenly became extremely vocal. And there was outrage about how dare he and how could he and all of this stuff when all of these people had been silent. And so there's a, there's a way in which when you love someone, sometimes, sometimes that's harmful in the sense that it blinds you from what, when they're, they're going wrong, that you're not willing. That, that Also, how many people, there were things that were happening in Israel prior to this that we were just like, eh, whatever, the government's okay. But now everybody's up in arms. So I think there's an important piece, which is that to love someone means sometimes you are, you are thoughtfully, you're analyzing them, but it also means that when you love somebody, you're not going to tear them apart. And so we've, that, that piece of love is missing from the conversation with Israel, that, that right. we've lost the sense that we love, we love our homeland, and we're just 
invested in this criticism, which, you know, it doesn't help us in our long-term relationship. Amen. Uh, Elias, last comment, and then we're going to pivot to Yeah, it, it raises another question when I'm reading and hearing you talking about this. Um, when you struggle in a marriage and we uh, and and you the first thing you want to do is to work on it, it is because there is love. So the question is not if you are going to work on it. The question is, is there real love to begin with? Right. Right. And but, but are you suggest right? So here's my right. It is possible. In fact. I think a lot of the people who criticize Israel the most love it so deeply. I mean, they love it deeply. So I, I don't have any problem with being critical. And in fact, we're going to come to the rabbinical assembly statement uh, at the end. I have no issue with being critical of Israel. My issue is giving up on Israel. You know, because there was a trope after, you know, Smotrich and Ben Gavir of sadly I cannot support Israel. The Israel that I love is gone. I mean, there was a whole trope of the Israel I love is gone. That's my critique is is with that. But that trope has been going for years. That's not a new thing. In fact, very much, especially among our younger generation, they would not view the relationship with Israel as a marriage. They would view it as an abusive parent in some right, sense. Right. That's, that's what I and mean. Either, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Michelle, but I don't know if I was clear about this. Um, we, are, we are assuming that there is love for Israel, a conditional love for Israel among right. everybody who is saying, I give up on Israel. Right, and that, that I think that is that, and Michelle, what you're saying, I think is the signal challenge. If, uh, if I were asked what's the single most urgent problem for the Jewish people today, I would say it is that the rising generation does not have that love. The rising generation does not have that because the Holocaust is a thousand years ago. The Holocaust is ancient history. Hard to believe that anybody would think that given the rise of anti-Semitism. I mean, I just read yesterday, I just read yesterday that some scary number like 51% of Americans today think Jews have too much power. Like all the tropes, this is not from the 1930s or 40s. This is like America today, 2023. Americans think Jews have too much power. Americans think Jews this, Jews that, Jews this, Jews that. That's today. Scary numbers today. So it's hard for me to imagine. That, but, but, um, but it is the case that in a rising generation, the love that you need for a loving marriage is not there. And figuring that out, when I was in Israel, we were staying at uh, the Dan Panorama Hotel, and I was happy to see a lot of buses that had college kids from Cornell and from Ithaca, et cetera, on birthright. I think, you know, uh, I think that's a good thing. We need to figure out how to connect our kids to love Israel. Uh, Mr. Nesson. Step on that. I mean, my, I've, I grew up in a generation where it really was unconditional love. Israel is always right. Um, now I'm a little bit more, I can be more critical, but I still feel that in my heart. My, my, the first time I went to Israel and went to the Golan, you know, and, then, and to see that for the first time, I think is really, really so powerful. So the, the idea of bringing people to, bringing kids, to fit, you know, younger generation to actually see the reality of the country is so, so important. And I'm glad that we're, we're doing, the show is doing what it can to, yeah. to, to do that. Michelle, you know. do you feel that the trip that you were just on you know, uh, check that box, the love box. It, it didn't just check a box. It created and fostered deep connections um, with especially among our kids who most of them left and said, I can't wait to come back and I really want to learn more. And when's Hebrew class? I mean, they, yeah. they <laughs> it, 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 you know, being there and seeing um, people who are genuinely connecting. I mean, and when we go as Temple Emmanuel, we don't just go to sites. We go to meet the people there. So for example, Yona Rosamond, our amazing religious school director, uh, religious school teacher here directed a program where she created a, a pen pal uh, connection between a school in Haifa and our school here in Temple Emmanuel. And our kids, when they went and they saw their pen pals, or even someone else's pen pals, you know, understand that there are people 
on the other mm. end, there's a community, there's a connection. There are cousins in the land of Israel, and, and they're deeply invested. Okay, good. So thank you for that. Let's pivot from that love note to Yossi Klein Halevi. Uh, what did you take away from his piece? What, what's his signature voice? What does he add to the conversation that is helpful? Too long and unnecessary. <laughs> you thought it was too long and unnecessary. <laughs> really? I agreed. You agreed? Yes. <laughs> I hate the like, judgment of this but yes, I was like, oh my goodness. Oh, I thought it was a super... Dan or so Michelle, I'm a rabbi, a so I didn't think it was too long. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it takes us 15 minutes to clear our throats, so... Uh, um, uh, no, but uh, look, I, I like his point that um, there, uh, I, I said it already today, sort of reflecting him, that yes, there is a deep and serious crisis. Israelis who are liberal Israelis do not see their values reflected, and they are afraid there that their values will um, be undermined within this current government. And guys, the, you know we have a long history, and only 75 years in Israel as a state, but as a people, we have thousands of years of, of um, being a, a people who have hope, who have a belief that um, we are not defined by any one given moment, and that we have the opportunity within any given moment yeah. to make changes. Wow. So it do, this does suggest that when you write sermons, they should be shorter and simpler, <laughs> uh, because it is the case, perhaps, that the length got in the way of his point. But I thought his point was absolutely essential. His point was, this was the 40-year anniversary of his making Aliyah. And his point was that he made Aliyah in 1982, um, after Sabra and Shatila, and during the middle of Israel's Vietnam, namely the Lebanon War, he talks, and you know, 400% inflation, and unprecedented civil dissent in Israel. He talks in this long piece about Israeli soldiers who fought the Lebanon War. They did miluim, and they got home from their duty. They took off their army fatigues, they put on their civilian clothes, and they went to the town square to march against, to protest the war they just fought. And that hadn't happened before. That hadn't happened before. And his point was, Israel got through that. They survived their Vietnam. They survived that unprecedented civil dissent. They survived 400% inflation to become startup nation. And therefore, it's like shopping in your own closet. When you look at your own history of, of, of being knocked down and coming back, he's confident that Israel can get through this. And what I loved about it is he, you know, one of the reasons for the length is that he's very articulate about the many red lines mm -hmm. that this government seems to be transgressing, um, and he doesn't give short shrift to it, and he's, uh, he's very concerned about complacency, and he names it all, but then he says, I am confident that we've been through worse and we'll get through this. And then what I loved about it especially is he brings us into it. Diaspora Jews are facing their own moment of truth. Some Jews whose connection to Israel has been wavering will be further alienated, and some may give up on the relationship altogether. But when someone you love is in danger, you draw closer, even if the threat is self-inflicted. Israel 1982, the low point, the nader, helped teach me about the meaning of love. Um, and if Israel was beginning to waver under relentless siege, if the tightrope walker was finally losing his balance, my place was at the fall. To turn away from Israel was to evade responsibility for my moment in Jewish time. And then liberal diaspora Jews, namely that's us, uh, need to seek out centrist Zionist forces in Israel that are determined to save our democracy, maintain Israel's heroic struggle for moral balance and adversity. We need diaspora Jews as partners in that struggle. I felt like of all of the thinkers, he was talking to me in a very direct way, and that we that we are called. So I guess my question to you is, how do you, if you sense that we are called by this moment, um, what's your response to this moment? Can I go back for two seconds? Yeah, please. Because I think the biggest issue that I have with his argument is that the argument that because we've made it through bad things in the past, we can get through now, is to me a really bad one. Because that argument would say, um, 
we did just fine without women voting. The country was actually fine. We were going in a great direction. But like the bad things that happened in the past, we can get through it. If you if you think that there's rights that are being trodden on now, it's it's okay. He's not That's saying that. He's though. not saying that. He's, he's the, he, the opposite. He's of saying that. in those moments we rose. And we right. made changes, and that's what we need to do again yeah. now. You know, it's not just, oh, these things are happening and it's okay, don't worry about it. It's these things are happening. There is a call to, to each of us, and our Jewish history tells us, and our Israeli history tells us, that we have the capacity to do it. So stand up and step yeah. up. And what what is really scary about his article, I think it was, he was the one that... You put so many articles, I got confused over <laughs> it. Uh, my brain only functions with, yeah. with a couple of them. What he says about the biggest problem, which is the growing population of Haredim and Arabs, Israelis, right. that only care about the land, not the state, which is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. right. That's the scary part of it. Right. So central Zionist Zionist democracy is very much in the balance, and he's calling for partnership. I want to just close, because the rabbinical assembly, you know, it's, it's tempting to think of this as a bureaucracy, et cetera, um, and bureaucratic uh, officialdom. I found the RA's statement stunning, um, because it's so, um, it, in my 25 years as a rabbi, it's unprecedented, because it is, it's holding two things. As the new government is seated and starts to put out policies and propose legislation, we want to make clear what you can expect, what expect from our rabbinical assembly, which is the Union of Conservative Rabbis. We will continue to express our unqualified support of Zionism and the Jewish state as these concepts are core to our values and religious beliefs and are unequivocal. Okay. There's a but. However, we may find that there will be times when it will be necessary to issue harsh critique of government policies that go against our core values or oppose religious freedom and pluralism. The current coalition has already indicated its intent to make changes that affect the democratic and pluralistic nature of Israel as defined in its Declaration of Independence. As a result, we anticipate there will be times when we will respond in accordance with our positions and principles that have been developed via our resolutions process as global organization whose main office is in North America. We also develop our statements and positions in close consultation with our partners in the Masority movement, et cetera. And then it says at the very end, and this was just so simple, um, these circumstances are new for us. Right? In other words, it's like a new, we're in a new, these circumstances are new for us. And, and they're trying to hold we love Israel, we love Zionism, that's eternal and unequivocal, and Lord, this is fraught, and we're gonna be, and, and the fact that we love Israel does not mean we're not gonna be critical, we're gonna be critical constantly and harshly, and this whole thing is new, good luck to all of us. Um, and I, I found that, so what did you think of the RA statement? Yeah, great letter, great, great. letter, absolutely, yeah. every word. Yeah, loved it, it felt so brave, so courageous, so important, and unlike the first letter we started with, which is about, see me, I'm against this. It, it was saying, we love Israel, and we're gonna use that love to be thoughtful, and we're gonna respond appropriately, and that's not gonna decrease our love, that's gonna be an expression of love because we care about this place. Yeah, so and what I, for, yes. Oh, I was just gonna say, for me, I think it's the second page of it, on page 19 that you have here. These include public statements and advocacy, behind the scenes conversations, including via coalitions. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be the most important, which is we're going to talk to not about. Right. So by the way, um, there's this new organization in Israel called Hartman. And, uh, <laughs> and I would love to make a call. We're having a meeting tomorrow morning at 1030 to talk about Hartman this June, June 21 to June 28 in Israel, in Jerusalem. Hartman is the place to engage all this complexity in the most thoughtful way. I'm going to be going. We already have a strong core of people who are going to Hartman. Uh, please come tomorrow at 1030. And ha with an open mind, maybe now is the time to talk to Israelis mm -hmm. and to be in Israel. Elias, you got a song to close us yeah. out. Elisa. Let there be love and understanding among us. Let peace and friendship be a shelter from the storm. <laughs> I love how though you guys have started. <laughs> Let there be love and 
and understand being among us. Let peace and friendship be a shelter from the storm. Thank you. And now our live stream closes and we get to have a conversation. <laughs>